So um, I will take you quick through this because we are behind time. But this is um, naturally falling in here because we were talking with Milan on the ecosystem of partners. And now this is going through um, really what that ecosystem brings, right? So we're going to kind of do a quick class on artificial intelligence here. Uh, maybe by show of hands, at least in the class, can you tell me how much are you already exposed to artificial intelligence? Yeah, you are. You are to some extent. No, some of you not much. Okay, good. We'll just cover the basics. If you think I'm going fast, then anyway, stop me for questions. But we'll try to go through uh, not everything, but at least high level. Um, so I can do it myself. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right. So this is what I was talking about, and this is continuous, right? So. Every year now, the human race is actually creating more digital data than all of the mankind before that, right? Every year now we're creating so much data. Every second is data, right? Now just imagine this call is getting live streamed and, you know, the, I mean, we're really in the digital pollution stage, but how much of this data are we actually using for decision-making, right? I told you earlier in the day, less than 1% is actually used for operational decision making. A lot of data, but very little insight and very little linkage between the actual data and the insight or the business action from it and the learning from these actions also. So these are kind of the main problems that you know at the industry level you will find now with data. If you look at the evolution of data, I mean, of artificial intelligence really. It's going from the big data, like the SaaS, you know, the analytics on SaaS, the big data platforms, uh, like the Cloudera, uh, like the IBM big data. Then you got, I think in the mid uh, 2000s, the likes of AWS and Google Cloud Platform and Microsoft Azure. Um, also then I think in around 2016, 17, you started to see IBM Watson, which is on towards the right side of the spectrum, right? So you're going from data platforms to machine learning platforms to more uh, augmented user intelligence, meaning where actually you are learning and starting to act like humans. The machine is starting to do something like humans. And then to industry cognitive cloud. So this is really building whole capability on cloud infrastructure with uh, cognitive run processes. So this is kind of where right now the industry is moving towards. Um, this is quite basic, but this is something I think you should understand and this will really help you a lot. So if you look at the spectrum from left to right, it's man versus machine, right? And you go towards the right, it is how much you can do like humans, like more like brain. So if you think of this, the simple Excel workflows we have or macros we have, or you know the simple approval flows we use in procurement, they're all like examples of basic scripting. Um, you know, you can script something and you know, it's, it's, it's also automation. These bots that you see, you're all used to bots, right? Chat bots and different kinds of bots. They are simple repetitive tools. They are also example of basic scripting. But as you keep going towards the right, you start to see that they are more starting to do from rule-based automation towards task. So they start to replace humans in something, right? Repeat activity. Um, they have some natural language processing skills. They can do a bit of dialogue, right? Um, I mean, I personally find pretty frustrating when, you know, after some time, like mostly on the chatbots, I'm typing the word agent <laughs> and trying to get to an agent because they don't understand, but it's okay. Over time, these systems are learning. Uh, but you have in a lot of places, factories and supply chain, a lot, you see the role of automation. I think you had an interesting project, Milan, right? Uh, this is exactly this work where you analyze uh, I think in your case, it was glass, if I remember, something to do with glass. What you needed, you needed uh, repair, repair, right? You needed some repair. 
machines to do but machines do stuff and then also in uh, health industry you see right how machines do the very complex surgeries and all all this is uh, ai at play so in as you go towards the right these machines are making decisions like humans um, and i was telling you earlier in the day the insight plum names come comes also from insight which is more towards the right side of the spectrum uh, so what can ai do for us of course it can start to understand the data derive meaning from some structured data and also unstructured data uh, it can interpret it can interpret things observations uh, example in procurement could be simple as what worked for you what sourcing strategy worked for you last time let's do it now or simple thing like hey the commodity price of something went down now now is the time to do it or you're aggregating it's reading let's say now reading emails and aggregating results you know what this is what the emails are reading and telling us let's do something here so demand aggregation is happening like that uh, they can reason support with evidence right uh continuously learn based on historical data so machines are taught to do uh, i mean i'm personally seeing a lot of progress in the last 5 years on machine learning like how much machines are able to learn and react and then they can also um if you tie in with other technologies like blockchain they can definitely assure you of the sanctity of data the you know like in case of supplier onboarding the compliance checks and stuff it's very useful in these uh, areas so ai is helpful ai is actually working on two things not just the operational data that you pull out in your reports but it's also working on unstructured data data in your emails facebook linkedin twitter and all that you know it's reading all that data data that you can't easily put in a structured report especially in environment like the sustainability guys here in the room you know that the relevance of this so you are not just you can't study sustainability in any isolation the sustainability work for you is really involving uh, understanding of tech you know and the role that tech can play to actually drive sustainability because i think that is the biggest thing that you can actually apply um, to to really make an impact at the moment measuring impact of sustainability driving uh, sustainability results is going to come from emerging tech it's hardly going to come from anything else so what is happening actually i go back to that slide what is happening here is basically you are able to use this cognitive digital brain and actually process your data third party data uh, external data like let's say weather is checking the weather combining with where your operations are located plus your own internal data and external data and combining all this to see your supplier risk your operational risk for example so it's that combination of internal and external now if we don't have this we are relying on the person that is doing the job for us in procurement the category manager for example we are relying that okay our guy is an expert like milan okay he's an expert on travel category let's say he can do the um, he will be on top of what we can save in this category and all that but the point is he's human beyond the point he only knows as much as he can update himself or keep him up to date right he can't all the time and he's also really just learning and seeing himself but if the machine is doing it machine is picking up even when he's sleeping right machine can pick up information and then have it there for you so it's not replacing humans it's making the job of humans better um to do more informed decision making i can back myself with 10 other data points that is what th this is doing and it's also making the user experience better i mean simple things you would have noted in your uh, phones right in your um personal life how like google and other things this reading your mail is reading your calendar telling you okay uh maybe this is your 10 minutes journey now because it's already thinking this is where you're going or reading your let's say ticket so it's already telling you that okay you're going to fly somewhere so it's doing all that stuff right this is give, giving you a better user experience isn't it so uh just things are just getting so that is what ai does it starts to transform the user experience and engage better so and the output of this is coming in different forms apps alerts um like i walk in this regent street and 
you know, you'll cross the Burberry store. My phone will automatically give me a message about some promotion inside the Burberry store. How is it happening? It's happening because of the, the location in your phone, the interest, and the, you know it's reading some data and it's giving you an offer. So all this is like just an example of smart alert, right? Using your profile, using your information, and in the context giving you the, so the scope is in every industry, every uh, field of all this. It's coming in the form of chatbot, packaged app, uh, and cloud app and marketplaces. All these are the output experiences of AI. I mean, ultimately, if you see 95% of the top 100 large enterprise will have AI into their products. This will be just in three years from now. Even now, by 2023, you will see that 65% of the fastest growing companies will have more smart machines and virtual agents than people. So more and more focus is here because people are understanding, the business is understanding the power or the impact of AI. It's simple, it's competitive edge. If you don't do it, you'll be disrupted, right? As a business, you'll be disrupted. So there are use cases of AI in every field, in financial services, travel, retail, manufacturing, healthcare, utilities. I mean, you look in every, I think smart meters, you most have smart meters at home, right? So this is a simple example of uh, AI. I don't know how many of you have the predictive health maintenance or predictive, uh, maintenance on your machines or anything, right? Uh, um, health is pretty common in the US at least, the diagnosis of health, predictive uh, diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> credit scores and credit risk is all, this is just AI. You know, it's it's collecting external data or data from multiple sources um, and so on. Pricing patterns on flight, dynamic pricing, right? You see dynamic pricing on clothes also. So I, I heard this now, it's not that new, but in Finland, maybe a few years back, they had not these, you know, you have the pricing tags on clothes. Um, they're fixed, right? And then you cut it and you put a sale price on it and so on. So there was somebody in Finland who invented these digital tags and they could change the price dynamically on those clothes. Seeing the demand, seeing the supply, seeing the stock, seeing the weather, you know, if it's related to sports, seeing the events, everything. And you could combine and just put the same tag changes to whatever price is the most optimal for them to balance their stock and their cash flow and everything, right? So it's, th this is just there. All this is just AI. So <clears throat> AI in procurement is a, is a real need, you know? It is not an option. We need it for decision making. We need it uh, to improve process. And you're really going now, let's say companies who have been digital for many years, for them, how do they mature beyond this? It's to go towards the AI, the graph that Milan was showing you earlier, you know, how, how I was also showing you earlier that, that automation now is basic. Digitization is a basic thing. Then you go into the layers of AI uh, and blockchain and other emerging tech and like IoT and you use it. Companies that are not even digital are here today. Fragmented process and sources, right? We saw in the transformation agenda. So they have to go from fragmented data, fragmented processes to digitization of their source to pay to actually AI enabled procurement. If they don't get there, they will still be very much obsolete. So newer tech that Milan was actually showing you, a lot of it does this AI enabled procurement. And this AI-enabled procurement is really what is now driving you competitive advantage. So I'll skip some of this, but use cases are many, right? So you can do more. Uh, where would you do automation? Where there is high cycle times, you know, high FT requirement in procurement, uh, low data exception. So you repeat processes. I mean, if you think of RPA, RPA, robotic, robotic process automation, um, personally, I'm not a fan of it, but you know, the way I've seen it work in procurement, like even on old SRM, SAP systems, they are, because they're repeat tasks you're doing in those systems, you build a RPA kind of application that does automate that task. So it does speed up. The only drawback of that is the minute you change that task for any customizers, you need to change that RPA. So it's expensive. What 
I would personally recommend is upgrade to a better system that eliminates the need for such manual processes to be automated through RPA, right? RPA is expensive. RPA is expensive to implement uh, for that um, use case, but it still saves you money compared to, you know, maybe getting humans to do that uh, task, right? So it does pay off, but it's not long term. Okay, so um, examples of AI in source to pay, you know, the buying assistants, apps that help you read and through natural language, you can process uh, simple things like, can I give a voice and, um, or can I just take a photo of something? Now, if, for example, take these big pharma companies, labs and stuff, researchers, right? Uh, they don't have time to really order test tubes or this or that, right? They will take a photo of what they need and, or they could give a voice of uh, instructions and the app does the buying for them. So simple example of AI. Um, contracts, you had the GDPR change a few years back. Imagine companies that had to manually read 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 contracts just to check one line, two line, does this apply here or doesn't apply here? All this, imagine if AI is reading 20,000 contracts for you in one go. Or simple example again, now you have a small change in regulation, right? The regulation of the law changes, right? Some things get upgraded. You have to analyze in contracts where does this apply? Where does this not apply in my case? Or if you're trying to do some piece of work, however expert you may be in procurement, you cannot always stay on top of local regulation, especially when you're covering a large area, right? So there, these, there's these contracts are hyper-localized. They are, they've got that intelligence. This is what new AI is bringing in procurement. This intelligence, um, that's why I also feel the direction of procurement, especially on contracts and sourcing, is that it should eliminate. It will eliminate. If you watch, I have a video on YouTube and also probably on my website. I'm really talking about the elimination of a uh, lot of procurement processes, especially sourcing and contract. Why? Because what is sourcing really? Sourcing is negotiation only because there is an arbitrage. There is some lack of visibility between you and me to come to a point where we agree right the transparency the more transparency there is there that leverage is zero like you buy on amazon or you buy on any marketplace and you think it's a fair price right why because the the market dynamics of demand and supply take care of it so like that i feel over time as we go into more commodity marketplaces uh, like you pay for Uber, for example, whatever fare you pay for Uber is what you pay, right? And you, then you think of that as the standard, okay? You don't really negotiate an Uber fare, right? Why that happens is because you, you have, you build that acceptability with more transparency that fine, this is what it is. So maybe Uber is still making profit in that, uh, but just an example or Amazon, of course, makes a lot of profit, right? In what they're doing, but they're still the lowest price for you. So I feel the procurement, more and more you're getting into commodity marketplaces, you will see that why would there be a need to have category managers to go and source when actually the software will give you the best price and the right time to buy and then right time to contract. And then it elim eliminate the need for contracting also. If it's the same law, if it's the same set of contracts, if it's the same kind of regulation, why do you need someone to sit and draft a contract, a master agreement template, you know, an SOW, when that service becomes a standard? So I think industry is really pushing towards marketplace in the true sense for service, for items, for all categories, right? Uh, the more you can create marketplaces, the more you will see that we are really living in this huge range that will eliminate. So it'll eliminate these tech, it'll eliminate people working on those tech, It'll eliminate people who are working without that tech on processes. So all these people, these are people like you sitting in the room, you will lose jobs. Your skills will become obsolete. So with time, what you've somehow got to do is you should know that this is coming, right? This is there. It already exists. This tech exists. So the one, one side today, we have shortage of jobs in procurement and more and more need for uh, skills in procurement. On the other hand, the tech that is coming in, if your skills don't match the tech that is there, or you're not able to really shift to this tech, 
then you know you are going to get obsolete right so this is why this is also very important in the context of just knowing where you should uh, uh, learn supplier insight this is a very big one financial risk of supplier the risk assessment tools that are there this this intelligence was really uh, you can say hidden now is getting uncovered supply management key focus area after covid also even more right to find more local supply chain to really uh, also cover on like i said earlier reputational risk and all that risk for the brand so ethical sourcing is important so all this is coming from supplier insight supplier data pricing insight again very important are you able to find the right external insight and accordingly negotiate if you have more data or more insight you can negotiate better so it also helps you negotiate better right if you have got five price points at your you will you will you will be confident negotiating with your supplier uh, <clears throat> advanced analytics is basically all this visualization of that procurement spend data procurement sits on a lot of data and a lot of intelligence so if someone really focuses like you know marco was telling in his presentation if you focus on data and there's lots of procurement now more and more in mature organizations you have a chief data officer role why because this is the real power right if you can really structure your organizational data into a whole cognitive data enterprise you have the power to really one make a strong strong impact to your business but also in the whole uh, industry uh, so all this advanced insights uh, risk insights this is all going towards informed uh, decision making so um these gives you the basics um these are just details so i'll skip through this but this is just explaining the use case in in more detail of 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 this right so internal pricing external market information that's the disruption right that you are you are getting that insight as a commodity manager so it's more power to you so tools exist today that give you this same combining internal information structured information with the unstructured data from multiple sources from outside right this is the disruption so uh, again very quickly on continuous innovation what are business doing now businesses are actually setting up ai departments and this has been going on for the last 4 5 years they are setting up these innovation departments and companies to really do more automation to more cognitive stuff why because they fear disruption or they fear competition right or their their competitors have done it so they have no choice but to do it um while they're trying to do this they're still struggling why because this is not their core their core is their business and also this is like a closed group when a company is trying to try to build innovation on their own they don't have the view of if already somebody has in it's like reinventing the wheel right if somebody already has done it somewhere else why should you try to reinvent the wheel and so what happens with companies is they are the projects in ai are normally failing and it's not easy building this this sort of a organization because to build this capability you firstly you need the skill talent and then you need to basically uh continuously work and not just as a proof of concept right take it into the mainframe system it's not easy to go from concept to delivering a result so this is where companies like us come in where we are investing is on innovation giraj so if we hire ai consultants what we are doing is trying to do use case by use case uh, identification of innovation in procurement and then put that innovation or that piece of tech on top of existing tech now if we've done it at one place we can take it to another customer the same thing in the industry or if it's procurement if let's say domain agnostic process you can take it to everywhere so this is what we are doing compared to let's say companies trying to do it themselves and if you do it yourself you're likely to fail when work in silos right so th this is kind of the principle when you do it on your own you're not able to go beyond proof of concept because 
sometimes it's business funding sometimes it's okay i got to poc i got to a good prototype but my main it system i don't have it or the skill challenge right so it doesn't really it's not easy to go beyond this so the best practice really is that for companies to engage with external firms who are doing it across a customer base uh, and augmenting your internal artificial intelligence capability so this is a key aspect of procurement right so go from your use cases build a cognitive sandbox design the user engagement design the process accordingly and then transform yourself to that digital cognitive business so this is again just to show you the spectrum that this is where you need to go from a use case to building a proof of concept to building an actual uh, solution and deploying it across your business units this is what you need okay so i'll probably skip some examples now but you know there are hundreds of application uh, of how <coughs> innovation is helping automate then save money and you do it one use case at a time and then over a period of time this becomes your second nature and over a period of time you really upgraded your systems to running all those innovation <coughs> so let me skip this part um essentially you are converting your company from a procurement function from let's say cost to a real revenue generation because here we are talking about building ip you are building intellectual property by doing this banks i've seen banks in australia do this i'm seeing some companies build some specific ai in procurement also it's coming from the fact that they are a bit frustrated with the state of the tech themselves right what are they offered in the long innovation roadmap of those so they started to build solutions on their own and it's totally fair right but when they build a solution on their own it's actually something that they can share in the industry and and they have the ip or the advantage where they need to collaborate with the industry they do like all the healthcare in us they did come together on uh, on this medical records the medical data because it helped all of them uh, collectively <clears throat> 